Well, good morning, Mac. Great to be with you. Great to be back from my uh, study focus for a month. I feel uh, refreshed in my in my heart. I, before I go any farther, though, I I would like to have us acknowledge uh, our our pastoral staff, uh, particularly Robbie, uh, Dan, and Micah as they preached through the. Uh, month of uh, July, and I'm wondering if we could just acknowledge him. Can we do that? And actually, I would extend that to our whole staff, because uh, without our staff, uh, I would not be able to take a a month-long study focus. I don't know what you uh, think about my month-long study focus. I uh, several years ago, the elders determined that I should take one month out of the summer and uh, focus on what's to come and uh, to drill down into Scripture and make a plan. And uh, sometimes people come up to me and say, Hey, Jeff, how was your uh, month-long vacation? And I, uh, I was thinking maybe they envisioned me out of my sailboat, on in my canoe, whatever, I don't know. But, uh, you know, truthfully... Uh, my study focus is one of the hardest things I do. Uh, it's uh, early morning, all week long, uh, through the day, uh, generating a plan for the coming year. And it's, uh, it's actually just pure work. It's not all of that uh, mountaintop experience that you might imagine. But I'm so encouraged about this, and I want to share this with you. There were several moments during the month, moments measured in minutes, where there was just a real sense of the presence of Christ. And that happens the other months of the year as well, and maybe that happens for you as well. But it's these moments measured in minutes where you sense that Christ is so very present. His beauty so evident, His peace so apparent, and I end up thinking to myself, I don't want to move from here. Have you had that experience? And, uh, you know, it's not only important that that be my experience, but that all of us have those moments of connection with Jesus. That's so crucial. Uh, Think of it this way, if you would. What, What would you rather have? Enough money and time to attend all the best leadership conferences in the country in a year? Or would you rather have one day with Jesus? What would you rather have? An all-expense-paid four-month cruise around the world or one day with Jesus? You might have to think about that one. Or what would you want for your kids? The best college education that money can buy or for them one day with Jesus? Connecting with Jesus is the key to the abundant life. And that's why I'm passionate about what we're doing here at Mac. We want to help people connect with Jesus. And in fact, that's going to be the banner over our coming year as we begin a new school year in the month of September, connecting with Jesus. And uh, we're, I'll share more about that in the weeks to come. Right now, however, we're, we're coming down the home stretch in our study of First Peter. And so through the month of August, we'll be finishing up in First Peter. And I would invite you to open your Bible to uh, that book. You can reach for one of our uh, worship Center Bibles as well, and find First uh, Peter chapter four, verses seven through eleven, and we're asking this question: that as receivers of grace, God's unmerited favor for you and for me, what are we to do with this grace? What are the strategies for living that Peter gives us for going forward? So I want to just uh, read to you. Uh, five verses from uh, 1 Peter chapter 4, picking up in verse 7, if you would. And there Peter writes, The end of all things is near. 
Therefore, be clear-minded and self-controlled so that you can pray. Above all, love others, each other deeply because love covers over a multitude of sins. Offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. Each one should use whatever gift he has received to serve others, faithfully administering God's grace in its various forms. If anyone speaks, you should do it as one speaking the very words of God. If anyone serves, he should do it with the strength God provides, so that in all things God may be praised through Jesus Christ. To him be the glory and the power forever and ever. Amen. In, in one sentence, what those verses are, are saying is that in view of the near future, live fully in the present to the praise of God. In view, in view of the near future, live fully in the present to the praise of God. Now, that's what those five, five verses say. But possibly, I lost you with the first seven words. Peter writes, The end of all things is near. Maybe, maybe the, the thought flashed across your mind, Really? The end of all things is near? Because, I mean, that's what Peter believed when he wrote that sentence 20 centuries ago. How, how can we really take that sentence seriously? 20 centuries is a long time. And we are a people who deal primarily in probabilities. I remember when uh, Mary Lee was diagnosed with, with cancer, uh, the way of dealing with such a serious diagnosis was based almost entirely on probability. Given the studies, given the statistics, given the evidence from the past, you should hope, Marilee and Jeff, to see your six-week-old Victoria turn two. And I remember, how can they say that? How can that statement be made? Well, it's because as humans, we deal primarily in probabilities. Based on the past, based on the way it has gone, this is probably the way it will go. So that when we hear that the end of all things is near, it's met, uh, that news is met with a, a bit of realism, a bit of pessimism. For example, the conflict in the Middle East right now uh, to us is just one more conflict that began back in the Old Testament. Nothing's, nothing's new. Nothing's different about the future. The conflict surrounding the Ukraine to us is just one more version of a Cold War that's gone for a long, long time. A few people, even Christians, believe that the end of all things is near. But Scripture itself has something to say about that. And so I'd like you to turn just a couple more pages in your Bible, if you would, to 2 Peter chapter 3. And we're going to pick up in verse 3. And I invite you to follow along as I, as I read. Peter writes in 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 3, First of all, he says, you must understand that in the last days, scoffers will come scoffing and following their own evil desires. They will say, where is this coming, He promised. They're saying, where is this end of all things? Ever since our fathers died, everything goes on as it has since the beginning of creation. What are they saying? They're saying probability suggests that the end of all things is not going to happen anytime soon. Verse 5, but they deliberately forget that long ago, by God's word, the heavens existed and the earth was formed out of water 
and by water. By these waters also the world of that time was deluged and destroyed. There's just no, there's no probability about it. God just spoke a word, flipped a switch, if you will, and it happened. And scoffers deliberately and intentionally deny that. Verse 7, By the same word, the present heavens and earth are reserved for fire, being kept for the day of judgment and destruction of ungodly men. Once again, it's going to have nothing to do with probability. God is going to flip a switch, as it were, and it will be the end of all things. Verse 8, But do not forget this one thing, dear friends, with the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like a day. The Lord is not slow in keeping His promise, as some understand slowness. You know, I'll say to someone, uh, we plan to meet at 3 o'clock, but it's, uh, it's now 10 minutes after 3. What, what took you so long? And uh, what I'm saying is I'm impatient. Uh, what, well, why aren't we, you know, I, I'm impatient. I, I don't like for us to move slowly. But God does not think of slowness as we think about it. Peter writes, as we continue in this passage, He is patient with you. Not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. Look, if you will, turn a few pages back in your Bible to 2 Timothy chapter 3. And again, uh, Peter says the end of all things is near. And the question, can we recognize when we're nearing the end? And Paul writes in 2 Timothy chapter 3, in verse 1, he writes, But mark this, there will be terrible times in the last days. And so the answer is yes, you can see the end coming. The last days will be terrible. But what does terrible look like? Verse 2, people will be lovers of themselves. Lovers of money. Boastful, proud, abusive. Disobedient to their parents. Ungrateful. Unholy. Without love. Unforgiving. Slanderous. Without self-control. Brutal. Not lovers of the good. Treacherous. Rash. Conceited. Lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Having a form of godliness, but denying its power. The last days will be terrible days. And this is what terrible looks like. I'm sure you agree that it's no stretch of the imagination to observe that these are the last days. 2014. These are the last days in the same way that for Peter, these are the last days 20 centuries ago. We are living in the very days that Paul and Peter wrote about 20 centuries ago. And it's imperative that you and I see this, that you and I not blow this off. Turn with me once again, if you would, to 1 Peter chapter 4, our passage for today. 1 Peter chapter 4, and let's look again at verse 7. The end of all things is near. And since this is a true statement, next word, therefore. Therefore. There is a, a way that you and I ought to live in light of the end in the near future. And it's not a natural way. The natural way would be to coast to the end. 
to ease into the end of all things, to decide, you know what, I've got it made, I'm so glad I'm a believer, and I'm just going to coast. That's the way we think, isn't it? When, I, when it came to the final exam of my last class in college, I did a quick calculation of my GPA, and I realized that whether I got an A or a C, it made no statistical impact on my GPA. And so, naturally, I concluded that I hardly need to study because I'm going to finish no matter what with the same GPA. And so, I didn't study, and I got a C. I coasted to the end of college. It's natural for us to coast when we're coming to the end. No doubt you feel that. Maybe you are in transition. Maybe you're going to go to a new job or a new community. And the temptation, as you know, because it's completely natural, is to coast from the end of this because I'm going to be beginning that. But Peter is exhorting us not to do what's natural. He's calling us, in fact, to what is supernatural. The end of all things is near, he says. Therefore, do what is supernatural. And he gives several ways to live fully in the present, but with the power of God. And I want to offer those ways as we wrap up our our time together. Uh, Verse 7 The end of all things is near. Therefore, be clear-minded and self-controlled so that you can pray. Praying is important in these last days. And praying is not natural. What is natural is is just to coast to the end. And, And so Peter sends up a red flare saying, don't do that. There's a, there's a battle going on. It's a battle for your mind. The enemy would have you lulled to sleep in these last days. But be clear-minded. Be self-controlled. Don't be led along by the statistics. Don't be led along by what is probable. Instead, he says, pray. Pray for what? Well, it's not a a grocery list of requests. It's not asking God for what you do not have. It's rather dwelling in what is already yours. And Mac, I just want to say to us this morning that the kind of prayer that we need, the kind of prayer that we need to commit ourselves to in these last days is prayer that is disciplined to dwell in the presence of Christ. To open your Bible and to turn to a passage of Scripture and simply dwell in the presence of Christ. Where you're patient enough to believe that He's going to come and manifest His power in your heart and your mind where you're willing to be there and be nourished and be refreshed without hurrying along to something else, to allow God to speak to you and to speak within you as the end of all things draws near. I love the way Henry Nouwen puts it. He says, through prayer... We can keep ourselves from being pulled from one urgent issue to another and from becoming strangers to our own and God's heart. Prayer keeps us home, rooted and safe. Even when we're on the road moving from place to place and often surrounded by sounds of violence and war, prayer deepens in us the knowledge that we are already free. That we have already found a place to dwell. That we already belong to God. Even though everything and everyone around us 
keeps suggesting the opposite. He continues by raising the central question, and he says, the central question is this, are the leaders of the future truly men and women of God? People with an ardent desire to dwell in God's presence, to listen to God's voice, to look to God's beauty, to touch God's incarnate word, and to taste fully God's infinite goodness. Those, those experiences happen in the context of prayer. And if you are a, a beginner, if you're, you're new to prayer, you don't need to start with the mountainous tasks of, of developing a prayer life. A prayer life is not the goal. A prayer life is the result of reaching the goal. You, you start with a, a childlike desire to simply connect with Jesus. Give me Jesus. I want to be with Him. I want to know Him. I want to draw near to Him. And if you have that goal and if you have that desire, your prayer life will come into its own. As a result of God's promise, those who seek me will find me. The end of all things is near. Therefore, clear the deck of your mind, be self-controlled, so you can pray, dwell, in his presence. Now, in addition, as we continue, he writes in verse 8, above all, love each other deeply, because love covers over a multitude of sins. He's saying love deeply. And that word deeply carries with it the notion of being stretched out. And it's not this... Uh, leaning back to stretch out as if in a lounge chair on the beach. It's stretching out in the other direction. It's leaning toward another person, intentionally loving them deeply. Why? Because loving deeply covers over a multitude of sins. When I was uh, younger, I, I took that to mean that if I love people deeply, then it'll cover over a multitude of my own sins. And so I loved people deeply <laughs> because I had many sins. But when I got older, I saw that that did not fit with what the rest of Scripture says. Our lives are not lived on a life-size scale where we hope that the good outweighs the bad. We don't earn our way into good standing with God. What Peter is writing about here is a love for others so deep as to cover over a multitude of their sins. To cover over is literally to hinder the knowledge of a thing. It's, it's loving people so deeply and so completely as to no longer make a focal point of their sins. I'm not going to let their sins keep me from loving them well. How many of us know that that's not natural? <laughs> okay, three of us. Um, that's not natural. It's not natural to love someone when I can see that they are wrong in something. But when you enter into honest self-evaluation, you, when you look in the mirror, when you look at your own heart and recall that God freely loved you in all of your sins, well, then something supernatural happens. You have the power suddenly 
to love other sinners with His love. You can love them deeply because you experienced that love. And Peter is saying, the end of all things is near. So put God on display in a world that thinks his, the end is improbable. Pray. Love deeply. And then verse 9 says, Offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. And I, I want you to think about how natural it is for us to grumble about hospitality. Think about that with me for a moment. And to really appreciate this, you need to know the culture into which Peter's letter was sent. A couple of uh, weeks ago, a group of us enjoyed a, a fabulous, uh, authentic Middle Eastern meal together with uh, Kevin Nolte. Uh, Kevin is from our own church family here. He's actually going to be transitioning and moving to the Middle East this fall. And uh, we were together with him for this fabulous meal, Middle Eastern meal. And during the meal, he shared with us that life, for the most part, in the Middle East is experienced around a table, enjoying a lot of food together. And uh, if you live there, he said, your table's always set for dinner. Not, not just for your own family, but for all your relatives as well. And so it's amazing. The, the relatives just come out of the woodwork when you're serving dinner for everybody. But here's the kicker. If you know any of those relatives, all you have to do is just know any of those relatives then you too are invited to that dinner. And so there, there could be 50, 60 plus people in your house every week for meals. And uh, Kevin told us of going over to the Middle East and, and knowing the, the relative of someone and talking to that relative. The relative invited him to a dinner where all the other relatives were and Kevin ended up staying there at that house for four days. How many of you would like to have Kevin stay at your house for four days? See your hand. Okay, again, three of us. Kevin, I'm sorry. Kevin's a really nice guy. But we, see, we have our space. We have our home. We have our way. We don't think of having strangers into our house all that often. But here in in Israel, needless to say, your house would feel like a revolving door. You and I would be complaining about that, right? But Peter writes into this culture that has all kinds of people in their home all the time. He says, don't complain. Remember how you have been treated. You were undeserving. And God welcomed you into His family. God gave you a chair at His table. You were overwhelmed by His hospitality. Put that same supernatural love on display again in your home. The end of all things is near. So pray. Love one another deeply. Offer His hospitality without grumbling. And finally, for our time together today, I'm just going to read verses 10 and 11. Each one should use whatever gift he has received to serve others, faithfully administering God's grace in its various forms. If anyone speaks, he should do it as one speaking the very words of God. If anyone serves, he should do it with the strength God provides, so that in all things God may be praised through Jesus Christ. To Him be the glory and the power forever and ever. Amen. And so, here it is. 
The end of all things is near. Not because it's probable, but because God promises these are the last days. And so, for His sake, live supernaturally as if you are looking forward to the end. Let us be found dwelling in His presence through prayer. Let us be found loving one another deeply, showing His hospitality without complaining and serving so that He will be praised. Has God by His Spirit spoken to you about one or more of these on that screen today? I just want to create some space for a few moments for you to be able to look at your own heart. and Maybe God has put His finger on an area. And I would just ask that perhaps we could have that list back on the screen. If we could put that list back up so that everyone can see which one of these would God have you give some attention to today? One of the things that I feel is an opportunity for us as we come to communion is confession. We can confess because God's grace gives us permission to be honest. And it's not going to result in God's rejection of us. We can simply be honest with God and say, God, this is an area where I need to stop coasting. And I need to start living the supernatural life for the sake of God. For the sake of Christ. And so I want to just give you just a moment to dwell in His presence and confess to the Lord as you feel led.